Hello everybody, uh, is this working? Can everyone hear me? That's a good sign, what a good start to things. Okay, my name's Jan Ware. Uh, my job title is National Live Music Coordinator with Sounds Australia, which is a glamorous job title for a not particularly glamorous job. Like basically what I do is a position created by the federal government to deal with planning, licensing and regulatory reform for live music venues, practice spaces and music scene in general. So mostly it's about building and planning reform and usually when I do these talks, I talk about building and planning reform and licensing law, um, which is really important. Like there are laws in place in Australia at the moment which mean music is actually a form of noise pollution but it's also really, really boring. Like licensing law, planning, building code, so dull. So often when I've done these talks in the past, I have, I have quite literally had people crying with boredom while I've been talking about it. So I thought today I wanted to try, you know, because it's off-putting to have that kind of reaction at every speech you do, I thought I wanted to try something different. And I was like, oh, I want to talk more generally about you know, what's happened to the music scene that I've, you know, I've known over the last sort of 20 years growing up playing in bands and and running to the music venues and I had this really complex kind of discussion about uh, post Breton Woods economic rationalist approaches to the, the economy and, and uh, digitisation and participatory culture and then I was going to show heaps of cat memes and it was going to be amazing and then I looked at the speaker list for today and noticed that, such fact we're all men, it's a very male, male forum, um, that we're all basically talking about music and the internet and, and the way technological changes alter the way people engage with music and all of the other people talking are kind of really well qualified in that field and then there's me with my planning law ramblings. So I thought what I'd do is uh, instead of trying to compete with them and talking about the, like the, the nuts and bolts of how things have changed, I'd just do like a long boring personal reminisce about uh, my, my life growing up playing in bands, that kind of stuff. and and. The reason I thought I'd do that is because I was probably part of the last generation to get into music before the internet, and I was part of the first generation whose engagement with music was shaped by that kind of technology, and it was shaped quite a lot. So um, I probably started getting heavily into music when I was probably 12, 13, so 1993. First one online about 95, 96. You can see this real shift over that period of time. And to understand how that's had an impact you sort of have to remember music is a cultural thing. It's, it's not first and foremost a sort of a, a technology or a business or a regulatory issue. It's predominantly you get into music because of something that impacts on you personally. So I was looking back and thinking, well, when I got into music, what, what was that about? Why did I get so enthused about it? And the first thing that, that struck me is, like this, this might, looking at me today, this might not be obvious, but in school I was a massive nerd, like I was a huge nerd. So I was even shorter than I am now, I was about a foot shorter. I was a lot fatter, I was quite a, a round little man, uh, elastic wasted pants, I had a kind of wafro um, into Dungeons and Dragons, like really into that like, role playing stuff and um, at one, I was so socially inept at one of my student teacher, parent teacher interviews, my mother went along to the school and I was so shy and nervous that one of the teachers thought that I was like a bit mentally below form because I was so quiet. So that's, that's sort of the beginning of that. I grew up in a place called Underdale, which is a really exciting place, as the name would imply. So it's the inner western suburbs of Adelaide. I'm from Adelaide. Um, kind of classic Greenfields development, 1950s. You can walk for like an hour, see nothing but old people watering their lawns. Uh, there was two, like the high school I went to, there was two popular youth hangouts. So there was this footbridge over this kind of crappy river that people would just stand on. And then there was the local McDonald's, like the car park by McDonald's. And my school had this kind of, I think this is a fairly universal thing, but this, this culture of like really pungent stoners and really cantankerous teenage speed freaks. And those were the two kind of dominant subcultures in my school. And that, with my sort of Dungeons and Dragons fetish and my Wafro wasn't really my scene. So I used to sort of stay at home feeling kind of uh, isolated and mopey as 13, 14 year old boys uh, want to do. And I would sit there with my radio, this is back in the days where you'd have a radio with a cassette player, I didn't have a CD player, and I would just kind of scroll through the uh, bandwidth on the radio trying to find interesting music. And that would have been just after Triple J had started, uh, so I would have picked up that, been horribly exposed to Powderfinger, 
Um, and then 3D radio, which was the local community radio in Adelaide, which is still going, and 5UV, which is student radio. And I remember sitting there in my room, just kind of going back and forth, trying to find interesting sounding music. And it was like being in a sort of space capsule floating through the void of Underdale, like this kind of lone astronaut just lost out in space, trying to pick up a homing beacon to this, this world that didn't suck. Occasionally getting kind of barraged by sort of asteroids of teenage stoners, and then just trying to find this, this alternate world. And you pick up these songs and you think, oh, there's, a, oh, there's another world out there. And I think it's a fairly universal experience for anyone who grew up in the suburbs. It can be a fairly isolating thing. But at that point, to try and find music in 93, 94, as a kind of a tubby little nerd out in the suburbs was really, really hard. Like, you had to spend literally hours just, like, listening to the radio, scanning back and forth. At some point, I encountered uh, Rage, staying up late as a sort of teenage insomniac. Uh, it sounded, I think I'd watched Letterman and then found Rage. I was like, oh, God, this, like, this music video that just go for hours and hours. And this was a big deal. And I'd stay up late until my mother came. I was like, go to bed. What are you doing? And... and there was no, I remember sitting there with the cassette player taping things off the television and writing down the names of the songs because if you didn't catch the song at that point, it was gone. It wasn't like you could look it up later on. It was this ephemeral moment of like, oh, this song, this, this, amazing, this amazing piece of music has just disappeared. So you'd, you'd spend hours trying to track down this sort of homing beacon to this better world and then once you'd encountered it, these little glimpses, these little kind of, okay, there's something better than being stuck in the suburbs over here. I've heard this song, this was amazing. To then try and buy it was even harder, like to actually own that object. First off, you had to have money to buy the object, which was pretty hard as a kind of 13-year-old in a single-parent household. Then you had to go, the places I could actually buy music, we'd go shopping down at Westlake's Mall. Again, every bit as exciting as it sounds. And I would go into... I think it was CC Records, I think it was like a chain record store, and go through the cassette tapes and see what I could find. So I'd hear a song, go there, really there wasn't that many records in that shop. So I kind of, uh, I think I managed to get, when I was 11, the first cassette I bought was, was actually quite good, it was uh, Public Enemies Apocalypse 91, and that was really exciting, but then I couldn't really find anything else, so the second record was like MC Hammer. <laughs> and after that you were really limited like Green Day and Offspring, and that... that you know, after a while, I was like, I kind of want something that's this, this other, other sounds out there I'm trying to find. Um, fortunately, my cousin got into music around the same time as me, and we would be listening to the radio and staying up late watching Rage and always just talking about the limited array of music we could get hold of and buying kind of like Spin and Rolling Stone and getting increasingly obsessed about it. And because we'd found 3D Radio, which was the local radio station, we discovered that there was these shows you could go to. People made music in, in our state, in our hometown. And yeah, it was a 45-minute bus ride to get there. We had to, you know, whinge until your mum drove you and picked you up for an all-ages show. But we started going to these shows. And it was, again, it was a very... It was hard to find out about them. You had to sort of be at the right place. You had to go to a record store in the city and find these, these particular moments that would say, OK, this is where the next show is, this is where the next event is. And this seems to have been a, a common experience of a lot of the, the kids I know. You, you'd spend hours listening to the radio, you'd watch Rage. Eventually you'd have this point where you would hit the local radio station and be like, OK, there's these this, this shows I can go to. Maybe I'll find other people there. So you sort of, like the, like the astronaut, lands on the planet. They know somewhere, somewhere in this venue, in this kind of student university uh, mini festival, there's other people like them. And we'd all buy these incredibly crappy band T-shirts. They were either way too big or way too small. And that was like, we'd landed, we hoisted our flag, our band t-shirt flag, and we'd wander around trying to find other people like us and sort of saying, like, I'm wearing this, this t-shirt for, like, Green Day. It means I like music. Is there anyone else here that likes, likes this music? We should be friends. We should hang out. Let's, let's change, exchange mixtapes. <laughs> and, and you'd do that, and eventually it would work. But if you didn't keep going to those shows, it got harder and harder. Like, if, you weren't, if, you, if your mum wouldn't regularly drive you into a Sunday afternoon show, you might not find out where the next one was. All it took was that somebody, you know, you went into, I remember going to the, the, the city with my cousin and just going to all the record stores and being amazed. But unless you could do that regularly, all it took was like the guy, the, the grumpy guy at the record store took the, the poster down early or the street press got thrown out or, uh, you know, the flyers for the show weren't there and you didn't know where the next show was. There was no way to find out. And you'd end up in these situations. I remember, you know, my mum wouldn't drive me into town one weekend, so I couldn't go to that Sunday afternoon show and, and didn't know what was going on. I was like, I missed out on this chance to hear all these bands, but there was no other way of hearing them. And one of my friends at that point ringing me up saying, oh, you should have come to this show on, on Sunday. You missed out on this, 
this great band called Not From There and they were just like Sonic Youth and oh, you would have loved it and, and then sort of going out to the living room and, and sort of sulking. My mother saying, oh, what are you sulking about? It's like, you know, he didn't drive me to town to see that show. He missed out a really great band. I don't know where the next show is. She's like, oh, I'm sorry, dear. Do you want to get an ice cream? I'm like, no, I don't want to get an ice cream. I went back to my room, listened to some cassette tape one of my newfound friends had made me. It was Brit Pop, and you can't sulk to Brit Pop. It's like, no, maybe we'll go get an ice cream. <laughs> and that's, that, that's, what, that's what music was like before the internet. <laughs> It was, a friend of mine was a few years older was saying, like, it used to be really hard to be into music. It was like, you had to really actively go out of your way to find music, and then ultimately what you were, ultimately, you were really trying to do was find other people that had this sense of community and use music as a way of ground you to other people, because otherwise, you were out in the suburbs on your own. You were just, like, sitting there getting miserable and bored. You, you were trying to use music because it was the only homing beacon you had to find other people. And then this marvellous thing happened called the internet. And I actually remember the first time I went online. I mean, I was a, my family's a bit of a, obsessed with education. They like their kids to, to read and play with computers. They're a big nerd family. Um, and I remember my aunt's a, a librarian. We went down to the basement of the State Library, and she was like, oh, the internet, play with this. I'm working. You play with this for a while. And me and my cousin, who'd been into, you know, obsessively into music for not very long by that point, sat down in front of, I think it was like Alta Vista or a Hotbot or one of those really old search engines. I don't know if there's anyone here old enough to remember those things. Um, and the first thing we did, and I remember it clearly, was started typing in the names of the bands that we liked, trying to find more information on them. Because we recognised immediately that we'd gone from this era when your only way of, you know, your only homing beacon to this, this, this other culture of these other people that weren't teenage speed freaks or like massive stoners, these other people who are like you, you know, it had been so hard to find those people, and then suddenly you had this machine that amplified your capacity to pick up that homing beacon massively. Just this gigantic uh, mechanism for finding other people like you through music. And this really hit home to me a while ago, because I went and saw one of the bands I used to love when I was 14, who have really put out some shocking travesties since then. Um, so, I went, so a while ago I went and saw Weezer, and here familiar with Weezer, do people still know about this band? So they haven't put out a good album in quite a long time. And I went and saw them, and a few other of my kind of nerdy old men friends also went and saw them. And afterwards we were like, oh, they weren't very good, were they? But deep in, down inside ourselves, our 14 year old selves were just pissing themselves with excitement that we finally got to see Weezer. And I was thinking, well, why is that? Why is it that this band hasn't released a good album in decades? They've released some songs that were just like horrible. Just horrible, horrible monstrosities. Why is it we all forked out $100 to go stand in a field and sing along in our raspy old man voices to this band that none of us really likes anymore? I was sort of thinking about this. And then I just sort of talked to a few friends. And one of the things that we sort of picked up on is that when we all started to get online, when we were all sort of 14, 15, 16, and we went from that isolated kid in the suburbs to having these, this internet presence, Partly, maybe Weezer's marketing in general appealed to the nerdy little guys out in the suburbs. I think they certainly had the right look for it. But partly, they had, for that year, they had a very strong online presence. And I found all these friends of mine who had, when they first went online, one of the first things they got onto was this, this Weezer mailing list, which I think was run by their fan club. And I remember it really clearly. Like, I used to go home from school and I'd signed up to this, this thing. I had the internet from home from 95, 96. This is back in the days where you had a modem that made phone noises and you, like it, you got charged a dollar per hour. So you'd be on the internet too long and your mum would come in and be like, what are you wasting all our internet time for? I'm not going to fork out more money for this, this this month. Get offline. And you're like, yes, mum. And then you'd stay online. <laughs> and I'd, I'd download this Weezer mailing list thing. So it came, it was a, it, you just post to some central admin organisation and they compile into this long list and you basically get a sort of 2,000 word essay of everyone's kind of 150 word spiels about music that day. And I would come home and obsessively read this, and as did my cousin, actually. I, when I first moved to Sydney, I met someone I met on that list in 1996, who still I think, works at FBI radio, still heavily involved in music. And a whole bunch of us, particularly in Australia, had found this list and started just posting to it, back and forth. Eventually, even though it was an international list, we went on looking for other people into the same music as us in Australia. Like it was, we would 
cite particular bands, we would pick up other people's interest in music, we would use that as the first entry point to finding new music. So a lot of the generic indie rock bands that I still listen to, so like uh, The Replacements and Sebado and all those kind of bands, I found out about through that list. It was this real kind of cultural, you'd go there because it was this cultural focal point that everyone went through. And through that list you started to find other people in Australia and then other people in Adelaide. And then you'd start to form your own mailing list and you'd start to kind of use music as a mechanism to find people in your own country, in your own geographic area, and then to cement a sense of community with them through this use of music. And it worked really, really well. It worked so well that you know, a lot of my friends, because they picked up on that, that Weezer thing in 1994, 95 online, that band became so lodged in their sense of self in there, it was, it was a sort of touchstone for their community. It was a way of like you say, oh yeah, I used to listen to Weezer when I was a kid, and other people were like, oh yeah, you're, you're in the same kind of rough sphere as me. And it was this sort of bonding point of, yeah, we've had this common cultural experience. And so effective was that kind of mechanism of embedding that band in our cultural life that we would fork out a hundred bucks to stand in a field to watch a band that none of us really liked anymore. Which is sort of a, like, if you look at it in purely mercenary sense, it's, it's a really it's a victory of marketing. Like, it's almost like a, like a sort of, what's that old quote about the Catholic Church? Get people in by the age of 10 and, and they'll be in the church for life. So the same thing, get them listening to Weezer by the age of 15 and they'll still be listening to it in their 30s. Which was, yeah, it was interesting. And then later on, I did a PhD in cultural studies uh, and looked at music and subculture and sort of uh, media and English studies approaches to, to music. And I was reading, I read all the kind of books that were coming out when the internet was first like, oh, we, we should take this seriously. So um, things like Chris Anderson's The Long Tail and all those kind of bits where marketing figured out the internet was worthwhile. But then I read this book by a guy called Andy Greenwald who was a journalist for Spin. So it was a music journalist who'd been involved with the kind of um, US punk scene, that kind of uh, Rites of Spring, um, Minor Threat, that kind of era of punk. And he had noticed during the late 90s and the early 2000s that this funny thing was happening. That the kids in the suburbs weren't buying records anymore. And he noticed this just probably before Napster kicked in and we started to see the really major shifts in industry where the record labels started freaking out because they couldn't sell albums anymore. And it's like, there's all these kids in the suburbs who are downloading and trading music and they're not buying records. And he thought, that's really interesting. So he started trying to figure out, okay, what's the emerging business practice that's going on around this? What's actually happening here? How is the community changing? How is the sense of engagement with music changing? And he went and talked to a guy called Rich Egan, who used to run, I think he still runs Vagrant Records in the US. I think Vagrant today has like PJ Harvey and Placebo and uh, I think the greats are on that label. But back then it was like Get Up Kids and they sort of early 2000s sort of emo bands, pop punk emo bands. And he was talking to this guy and the guy was saying, you know, what's really happened is like, we've shifted our business model to selling merchandise and uh, doing a lot of touring and that, that works reasonably well. But moreover, what we've done is recognise that we have to make our website a centre point. Like it has to be the homing beacon for every kid who's bored, miserable, and wants to get into music, and is trying to find a way to do it while stuck out in the suburbs. And uh, Andy Greenwald's response to this was like that: for most teenage, the teenage punk fandom was 70% 70, 70 about the community and 30% about the music. But overwhelmingly, people were looking for a way of connecting with other human beings, and the music was the mechanism to doing that. But you know, this is a most contemporary music comes out of folk. It's, it's, it, these are folk musics. This is a folk tradition. It's, it's, it's an art form. Overwhelmingly, what they were trying to do was use music to connect to other people. And what you saw with those sort of labels like um, Fagrant is that they drove the first waves of sort of uh, Web 2.0, so social media stuff. So they produced uh, long kind of um, message boards that became incredibly active because everybody came there to talk to each other. They would bridge the geographical divide of being in the suburbs by using these message boards. Out of that you started to see things like Live Journal, um, what was it Diary Land, uh, Makeout Club. Does anyone remember Makeout Club? Like this is, it's kind of like a really crappy teenage hipster version of Facebook but like five years before Facebook. And I remember it hitting in Adelaide in probably 2000 or so. And you could search people on it 
based on geographic location. It was like the homing beacon had zoned in and said, look, these are the people within 25K of you. Like it, 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 you'd never been able to do that before. It was a way that you could find people with a common cultural identity to you within your geographic area. And it was amazing. And you did see a response in the punk scene at that time in Adelaide. We'd had a lot of venues shut down. There'd been real crack sounds on our traditional capacity to come together as a community uh, around particular venues or record stores. And then suddenly we had this digital media that meant we could still find each other. And it was just revolutionary. And oddly, reading Greenwald's book, he actually says Weezer was kind of the first band that used this approach to lodge your band online in people's sense of community, hit that kind of suburban sense of isolation caused by geographical distance, and then get people to see your band as the portal to interacting with their community, and people will still be buying your records years later, which works really well. And it's still kind of what's happening, that people will use an online medium to find community first and foremost. Uh, that, to put that in context of Australian music, remember that it's always been about trying to find people with common cultural taste in your area. So you may be using an overseas band, but ultimately you want to see local shows. You want to take part in your music scene because it is your community. So for me, yeah, I got into overseas bands to begin with, but ultimately I was trying to find a culture I could participate in and produce this kind of common cultural life with. I've stayed in music since I was, what, 14, 15. I've been playing in bands, uh, putting out records, running venues. For, I'm 33 now, for quite a while now, more than half my life. I can't see that ending. I've kind of ended up being kind of the perfect Australian music consumer. I still pay for music. Uh, most of the last records I've bought have been Australian. And I was sort of thinking about this and thinking, well, it's actually got a lot easier to be involved in music now because you can find that sense of community very, very easily compared to what it was like when I was 13. And that's really positive. Um, that it's much easier to get people engaged with music now. And that I look at a lot of the younger people I know and, and the, their passion for music and the type of work they produce is actually better than what it was when I was a kid, which is nice, it's good. Particularly when you're in my line of work and you, you spend most of your day dealing with like how regulation has shut down a music venue and you talk to people about the impact of kind of illegal downloading or all these things that have been really negative for music. And we spend a lot of our time focused on that, that negativity. And I was thinking, well, is it kind of a bit of a case of we focus on regulation or downloads or the decline of the record store? And it's like, well, we stop seeing the forest for the trees. We see the individual negative tree. We don't see that the forest at the moment is actually full of probably more people who are totally impassioned about music and totally devoted to it, producing really amazing work. And I thought that was probably a nice point for me to end on. Because you're going to, as you go into working in music, if you're already working in music, it is easy to get caught in the negativity and to forget that, yeah, look, things have changed because of technology, because of regulation over the last 10 years. But ultimately, we still have a really, really strong music scene in Australia. People are really passionate about music. And I think that's the end of my speech. Thanks.